In this video, we're going to get Altair's time sharing basic up and running and demonstrate it with two simultaneous users. And yes, you heard me right, I said time sharing and simultaneous users on an Altair 8800. The product actually works amazingly well. It supposedly could handle up to eight simultaneous users, which was more than pushing it. But for two to four users, especially if you were doing interactive type uh, work, for example, drilling students with math drills or something like that, it could easily keep up with those terminals. All right, so we're going ahead and fire up the computer, give it a reset. I'm going to use the disk bootloader ROM to load the program. It's up at 177400. We'll examine that location. Now we're ready to run it. Now, we typically set the serial port that the terminal is connected to up here in these upper four bits. Now, if you think about it, in a multi-user environment, there might be more than one terminal. In fact, there will be more than one terminal. So what does this mean? Well, when um, Time Sharing Basic powers up, it has to go through an administrative setup procedure on an administrator console. So that console is the one that you specify here. Now, to be truthful, Time Sharing Basic requires all user terminals to be on two SIO ports. So it really doesn't matter, but technically the administrator's terminal that's used during the power-up initialization sequence, that could be something besides a 2SIO. But in our case, it is a 2SIO, so we'll use our standard settings we do in most of our videos to say that. Over here, for disk basic on the other fours, you typically don't have to specify anything, but time sharing basic does look at some of these bits, so the safest thing to do is to set those to zero. So 2SIO port on the administrator console, and set those to zero, and we'll boot. All right, it looks like that's done. And if we look over here at our terminal, we can see the prompts that come up for the administrator. All right, now this is a little different of setup than we've done ever for any of the applications, basic or otherwise, that we've done in the past. Because it's multi-user, Time Sharing Basic had to take advantage of the interrupt capability built into the Altair so that every user would be serviced in a timely manner. So the main thing we have to set up here first is how all those interrupts are used. So this will be totally different. Right now it's asking us if we want to reconfigure. Now normally you would just say N for now and continue, but we'll look at this so we can see what's going on. We'll type L to list. And if you look it says at level zero, that's interrupt level zero, the highest priority possible interrupt is one disk. If you had set up to use two or three disks, then it would have a two or three there. All right, it also asks for the timer interrupt. The timer interrupt is used to um, swap out users, give each user just a certain amount of time so that everybody feels like their terminal is being responsive. It's a 60 hertz interrupt. It could be at any level you want. However, they recommend that it be higher than all the terminals. So the disk is locked at zero, it has to be. Timers typically put at one. Below that, levels two, three, and four, these are lower priority interrupts, are the terminals. And you can see we have two terminals at each of these interrupt levels. The, the numbers next to the terminals are the I.O. addresses of the terminals. 16 and 18 are the two serial ports on the default 2SIO board that's in, um, in Altair's. That's how they ship. And that's where our two terminals are, 16 and 18. These others, we don't have those boards stuffed, but it doesn't matter. So anyway, that's the interrupt setup inside this computer. So now we'll say no to that, and it will now continue with the initialization. Memory size is like we're used to. Now it asks for how many users. We're going to run two users. And to identify a user, it's identified by the I.O. address of the serial port for that user. So the first user was at address, I.O. address 16 and it's asking how much memory do you want to give them. We've got 38K, so let's give them 18K of memory. Now it's asking for the second user. He was at IO address 18, and we'll give him 18K as well. So it's telling us that we didn't use 2,000 bytes. Now it's asking for a mount password. You can give a password to certain users, and only those users could mount or unmount a disk. So we'll just give it pass for password. And as soon as I hit return here, then BASIC will come up on all the user's terminals. So what I want to show you here is both terminals. And at this point, I'll hit return. And you can see now that all users are getting 
the, the standard boot saying that Altair Timesharing Basic version 1.1 is up and running. All right, now quickly on the two terminals I'm using here, over here on the left, it's kind of blurry because it's, uh, let me see if I can focus it a bit for you. Uh, this is a Hazeltine terminal right out of the late 70s, uh, very, ter very period specific. The other terminal is, looks like a PC, but it's not. It's actually a terminal. It's made possible by a great little product from Vince Brill called the Pocket Term. So if you have uh, leftover monitors laying around and PS2 keyboards, you can use the Pocket Term, which is a circuit board about the size of a postcard, and uh, turn that into a great little serial terminal. You can see some of the configuration options that remain down here at the bottom for baud rate and color and things like that. But uh, yeah, this product from Vince is a great way to get some mileage out of your old PC hardware laying around and get yourself a terminal for very, very little cost. All right, so let's get this going. Um, this is just normal basic. You can print 2 plus 2 and C4. This user can do the same thing. It might be hard to read that, but they're, they're both coming up. Let's see. Let's focus on this terminal. All right. Um, again, before you can do anything, you have to mount the disk. So we'll say mount 0. This is going to ask for the password that we put in earlier. And that way, only users you wanted to could mount a disk. And so now it's mounting that disk. So over here, we can do files to see what's on that disk. It says waiting. That's because this is in the process of mounting still. Okay, the mount completed, and you can see now we got the list of files. We have four files, Prime Number, Craps, Galaxy, and Star Trek. So either user could load a program. We can load the Primes program over here. And I could load, say, Star Trek over here. And you can list this program. And you can see this is continuing to work while this is loading. This is a short little program. Now the Prime's number program, uh, completely CPU bound here, so it's not prompting for your user input, not going to the disk drive, so this is completely CPU bound. But look over here on our other terminal, and you can see even though this is 100% utilization of the CPU while he's, in, he's running, we're still able to list programs and do other things over here on the other terminal. So it works pretty well. Now you'll notice that if I cut this program off, that the listing speeds up substantially. That's because this is a very CPU intensive program. Let's load something a little more typical that had some user input. For example, craps. So it's loading while Star Trek listing is going, and you can see disk I.O. doesn't slow it down that much. That's because disk I.O. uses the interrupts and gives some free CPU time to the other user. Alright, so now we'll do a listing over here again. See the craps, every time it's prompting for uh, user input, you know how to play. Um, it's asking for my name. You want to try your luck? Sure. It's not going to like that. Oh, didn't care. Let's be gross green. But you can see over here that just continues to run, especially when user input is involved. So let's go ahead, of course, and run Star Trek over here. Meanwhile, we'll come back here and uh, See, they want me to bet some money. Let's bet $10,000. I've doubled my bet. I'm, I'm now worth $45. Okay, and Star Trek's running over here. Let's uh, fire some phasers, or what are we going to do here? I guess I did a scan. Uh, we're going to fly. So over here, we're moving through the universe, and here I'm going to play another game of craps. So I'll bet all $45,000. Let's see if I can win or lose. It's still going. I haven't won or lost yet. Oh, I've lost all my money. All right, and we can see Star Trek's running over here. Fire a photon, photon torpedo. But anyway, so there you go. Two users running simultaneously on a Altair 8800. Uh, reasonably responsive, especially if you're doing user-type programs where you're answering questions and uh, typing things in. Then it keeps up quite well. Um, and again, I'd recommend this pocket term from Vince Fear from uh, Vince Brill if you guys are looking a way to use your old hardware up and have yourself a spare, a spare terminal. All right, now the computer used for the demo today is actually an Altair 8800 clone computer. This computer duplicates the look and feel, the features and performance of a real Altair, but it does it with modern hardware on the inside. This makes the computer much more affordable and reliable than a vintage computer, and you don't have to worry about damaging it as you run through all the exercises that we've been doing in all these videos. 
Be sure to visit the folks at AltairClone.com to learn more about this great computer.